Welcome to class one of three of 3D Without Glasses about autostereoscopic 3D displays. I'm Greg Favalora and I have been researching and developing 3D displays for over 20 years. I work at Optics for Hire, a product development firm near Boston. Are you interested in 3D such as 3D cinema and stereoscopic video games? Do you wonder if it will be possible to see 3D without needing to wear special eyeglasses? It is possible. After you watch these three courses, you'll be able to name and understand a wide array of auto stereo displays. 3D displays have been shown in movies at least since the 1970s. This might color the public's impression of what exactly the state of the art is. Are these special effects? Are they real? Here's one funny case. This is a clip from a show called CSI New York. You could see a volumetric 3D display, which is a type of display you'll learn about, and it's projecting a 3D image of a brain. That dome really is the dome of a 3D display, uh, but that imagery was added as a special effect. 3D is depicted in movies and military grant proposals and in corporate and student research projects, but what's real? About these classes, you'll learn why things look 3D. Some of those reasons are hopefully going to be new to you. You'll learn the underlying challenges of why it's hard to make a good 3D display. And this is mostly a survey of lenticular displays, parallax barrier displays, volumetric, holographic, and other systems. Most of those will be covered in uh, class two of three. There's really no prerequisites. Uh, we assume you're generally scientifically minded. Um, there's no math or optics beyond some really simple basics, uh, though some sections are slightly more technical than others. By the way, these classes were produced by a company called Optics for Hire we invent and improve optics-based products. For example, LED light shapers, complicated lenses, and entire prototypes that use electronics and mechanical engineering. We're three, uh, 25 people in three countries. Our CEO is John Ellis, and uh, I'm Greg Favalora. I've been developing 3D displays since 1988, have some patents and publications in the area of 3D, and help run the annual conference on 3D, which is the SPIE conference on stereoscopic displays and applications. I founded Actuality Systems, which made volumetric and other 3D displays for 12 years, and then Optics for Hire acquired its assets and patents. If you need optical, electronic, or mechanical design or prototyping, please keep Optics and Hire in mind. Uh, here are some of our customers with work spanning video game cameras to laser systems to LED optics. Here's the entire agenda for uh, the course. Today we'll start with the fundamentals and in follow-on courses you'll learn about quite a few interesting 3D displays. So let's get started. The fundamentals have uh, many parts. You need to understand depth cues, that is, what is it that you could see that causes you to see in 3D? What are some common ways to create three-dimensional images? Why is it so hard to make 3D and, and why does that uh, imply that you need to be able to control billions of bits per second. We'll talk about a few good enabling technologies and also sort of uh, warn you about currently impossible techniques as well as the way to figure out what is snake oil. Let's begin with a review of some depth cues. And here uh, in the picture you can see John Merritt demonstrating one of these depth cues at the SPIE conference on stereoscopic displays. Here's a collection of monocular depth cues, and by the way, I want to credit uh, and thank Neil Dodgson, who is a professor at Cambridge University, who's an expert in 3D displays, uh, as well as a variety of other things. Um, so monocular depth cues are things that cause you to think you're seeing something three-dimensional, even though uh, you're only seeing something two-dimensional. That is, it gives you the sensation of depth, even with one or only one eye open. Some of these you've probably seen before and thought about, such as occlusion. That uh, means that if two objects block one another, um, then the one in front, uh, it's sort of obvious which is the one that's in front. Uh, relative size is similar to that. So if you have two similar objects, one of them's bigger and the other one's smaller, you sort of assume the smaller one is farther away. Uh, focus. So if there's an object that is sharply focused and nearby things are kind of blurry, you deduce that the blurry things are at a different depth than the one that's sharp. Um, another one that you've probably thought about before is called foreshortening. That's on the bottom in the center. 
An example of foreshortening is that things look smaller the farther away they are. Uh, that is, parallel lines sort of appear to get close together as they recede off into the distance. Um, and that's uh, the case for the way human eyes work, though not all lens systems cause that to occur. Uh, telecentric lens systems um, basically preserve um, parallel lines regardless of how far away they are, which is sort of an interesting case to consider. Also, uh, there's motion parallax. That means that if you were to move your eye or your head, uh, then the relationship of objects with respect to each other change. That shows you that things are at different depths. A final example of one of the more obvious monocular depth cues is a texture gradient. And an example of that is looking at a field of wheat. So the wheat that's really far away might look like a solid color like gold, but as they're closer and closer the texture changes into things discernible as individual plants, and that's called a texture gradient. So here's a painting um, from 1481 that really demonstrates a lot of these depth cues at the same time. You can see foreshortening, shading, uh, the people in the foreground occlude each other, so you could assume that the ones whose entire body you can see are probably in front of the ones uh, behind them. Now, here are a number of cues that you might not have considered and certainly surprised me when I started learning about them. And I want to thank uh, one of my colleagues, um, Shojiro Nagata, who co-authored an article for the IEEE in 2000 called Just Enough Reality. That is, what are some things you could do, what are some subtle tricks you could play to sort of trick the eye into thinking you're seeing 3D? Um, there are a few of these. Uh, one that's particularly interesting is the act of looking through a small hole, and I'll show that on the next slide. But before I do that, uh, we can consider uh, a different one, like the very last one on the list is blurring one's eyes focus when viewing in stereo. So if you've ever tried watching a sporting game on TV and intentionally crossing your eyes a little tiny bit, causing them to defocus just a little bit, uh, at least for me, I get an impression that the parts of the image kind of pop out relative to things that are in the background. Uh, here's an example that I want you to try the looking through a tiny hole example on. So this is a early photograph of my son sitting at a football game and so you could see him really close to you and there's people in the stadium far far away uh, go ahead and cup your kind of close one eye and cup your hand and put it in front of the open eye as if you're looking through a tiny little tube or tiny little hole and now position it such that you could see um, a little bit of his purple hat and um, spectators far away and this might cause you to see a very slight sort of depth perception effect. So if computers are so good at rendering things that kind of look 3D, even if you see it in only one eye, what benefits does a true 3D image have? Well, there are a number of 3D cues that are simply not provided by a 2D image. So the first one is stereo or binocular parallax. That is, each eye sees a different image. This is also called stereopsis. And of course, the data that comes from your eyes to your brain are processed in a nearby but kind of interleaved regions in the visual center of your brain. The next one is motion parallax or movement parallax. Uh, if you want to sound fancy, you can call it ego motion. So that is when you move your head, the world seems to sort of change. Nearby things move at a different rate than far away things. The last two things on this list are of particular importance when you're talking about stereo displays. These are called convergence and accommodation. Convergence is how your eyes converge or swivel in and out to focus on the thing that you're looking at. So if you put your finger up in front of your face, you kind of go cross-eyed looking at it. But if you relax and look way off uh, in the distance at infinity, your eyes go parallel again. Now this is related to focus because of course you focus um, in different ways depending on how far away things are. Living in normal real life, your brain sort of has this mapping, this relationship between what convergence is supposed to go along with what accommodation. But new technologies, such as some stereoscopic viewing techniques or stereo cinema, attempt to break this natural relationship between convergence and accommodation. And that's uncomfortable for some people. For example, if you're at a movie and there's uh, something jutting a few feet or meters outside of the movie screen, your eyes will cross to make it come into view but they're still focusing way back at the screen plane, and that takes a little getting used to.